Muy bien, le agradecemos al, al doctor Manuel Antonio Ramos esta entrevista, interesante entrevista con el doctor Justin Schwartz, quien es nuestro invitado especial en esta cátedra Douglas Ocheroff, edición 2017. A continuación, quédense con la conferencia que hemos aprendido de laboratorio a la industria por el doctor Justin Schwartz. Thank, thank you all for being here. It's, it's wonderful to see uh, such a full house, and uh, I hope you're not all just skipping class, and uh, you're here for a reason. Um, Noel, I want to thank you for inviting me and for, for having me here to this opportunity to talk, um, and to all of the faculty here at, at the university for, for inviting me. It's a, it's a true honor. I know the um, previous speakers have had uh, great stature um, that you've had visit, and so it's truly an honor to be, to be thought of in that, that same circle where I, I don't usually think of myself. Um, so I'm going to talk today um, about superconductivity, and <clears throat> I'm going to try, what my, my aim is to um, not just give you some of the, the history of superconductivity from discovery to where it is today, um, but also try to tell the story of how uh, the, the challenges and opportunities that come with trying to translate basic science discovery into technology. Um, and also some, hopefully give you some excitement about where superconductivity is going uh, in the future. First, um, let me say a little bit about my, my university where I've been for about 100 days now. Um, so I joined Penn State just in the middle of August. And so you can see the, the blue star is where we are in Penn State. Let me see if I can figure out how my pointer works. There we go. So this is uh, central Pennsylvania. Um, it's, uh, it's about two and a half hour drive to Pittsburgh and about a three hour drive to Philadelphia or a four hour drive to Washington. Um, other than the universities, we're surrounded by farms. It's, a, it's true farmland. Um, so some of my best friends are cows. And uh, um, right now the weather is good. And if you like uh, skiing, we actually do have skiing right in town. Um, it gets a little bit uh, colder in Pennsylvania than I think you'll get here in Juarez, for better or for worse. Um, so there we are. This is. Uh, Penn State University. Penn State University is a little bit different <clears throat> from every other university in the United States. So um, most of these states in the U.S. have a system of universities. So in North Carolina, there's North Carolina State Universities, the UNC, uh, Chapel Hill, um, Western Carolina University, Eastern Carolina, right? In Florida, there's University of Florida, Florida State University, University of Central Florida, University of South Florida. But they all are basically independent universities, even if they all get money from the state. In Penn State, in Pennsylvania, we really have just one university, Pennsylvania State University. And with the university, we have 24 campuses. So um, the star is, the, is where I am in what we call University Park in the middle of the state. But every one of these other circles is another campus. Now, they're all much smaller. But organizationally, we have one president over the whole university, one provost. Um, who are responsible for this entire network, and then under them are people like me, deans and, and leaders of each campus. So it's a very different uh, system. It means that we have 100,000 students enrolled in Penn State University. And students are able to go from one campus to another. Um, they have to go through some procedures, but they can do some years at one campus and then other years at another campus and still get one degree from Penn State University. And it's, it's fairly seamless uh, in terms of how they move about. So, there's 100,000 students in total. Um, in University Park, where I am, there's about 45,000 students, so that's a typical large US campus. But because of these other universities, we're actually much, much, or these other campuses, we're much bigger. And so across all of these campuses, we have um, 27,000 faculty and staff. And so it's a, it's a big organization as well. Um, we offer over 160 bachelor's degree programs, over 160 different graduate programs, and over 90 associate degree programs, and that's all supported by um, the 27,000 faculty and staff. The university-wide research is not quite a billion dollars, but it's getting close. Um, but the total budget for the university overall is, is about four billion dollars. And while we're called the Pennsylvania State University, only about five percent of that money actually comes from the state of Pennsylvania. Most of it comes actually from tuition, which is why it's good we have 100,000 students. Um, so I invite you all to come and visit um, any one of the campuses, but certainly uh, University Park in the, in the middle of the state. Um, and I will say that at University Park, um, engineering is actually the largest college uh, in that, in that uh, enterprise. So University Park has 45,000 students. 
Of those 45,000 students, almost 10,000 are in engineering. Um, that includes 8,300 undergraduate students and not quite 1,500 graduate students. Um, most are full-time. You'll see only a small number are part-time. Uh, unlike most state universities in the US, um, we actually have a, a growing population of international undergraduate students. Um, so we're at the point now where we have about 17 to 18 percent of the undergraduate students at Penn State uh, are international. And then what is not uncommon, of course, is that our graduate program is almost two-thirds international. Um, so even though we're in the middle of a, of a, corn, of a bunch of corn farms and soy farms, um, we are a, a, a meeting place for people from around the globe. Um, we have 12 academic departments in schools in engineering. Um, those 12 departments support 45 different undergraduate majors and over 60 different graduate degree options, um, including options to do integrated undergrad and masters, um, including new programs that bring multiple departments together. So we've just launched the first um, master's program in additive manufacturing, I think, in the, in, at least in the US. Um, and we have a very large um, world campus presence also. So we have both local learning and distance learning as well. Um, the size of our faculty in engineering is shown here for the last 10 years. It looks kind of flat. There's actually about 10% growth. Um, for those in the back, this bottom, the black is full professors. The light color in the middle is associate and the blue on the top is assistant professors. Um, and the interesting thing is while we've grown by about 30 faculty, um, we've actually uh, had a significant turnover in terms of um, senior faculty to, to junior faculty. So we've gotten much, much younger. We've actually hired over 100 new uh, faculty since 2012, and we're looking for another 20 right now. Um, so we're expecting this number to, to pick up. So we are growing uh, in size, and we're also growing in, in youth. And this is a, a, a plot of research expenditures in engineering. This drop was actually um, two things. One, it was the end of the stimulus package from when uh, the economy collapsed in, in 2009, um, and also a change in the way we did accounting. So it's kind of a funny, a funny graph. But we're running around $130 million in engineering research every year as well. All right. Um, one last thing I will comment on in Penn State is entrepreneurship. We, um, the university overall, engineering and across the board, is focused on impact. Right? So we're not just looking at, at scholarly work for papers for paper's sake, but we're looking for impact on the world. And one way we do that, of course, is entrepreneurship. So we like to say, think like an entrepreneur. Um, and these smaller boxes, whoop, jumping ahead, um, point to food and bio innovation, new media, new ventures, social entrepreneurship is a big thing uh, at Penn State that's growing. Um, so the entrepreneurship program at Penn State actually started in engineering. And then in 2013, the university said, wow, that's really a great idea. Let's take it over. And so it's uh, now across eight different programs across the university are involved. And it's my clicker stopped, okay. Um, so we started with this, this engineering entrepreneurship program. Um, since 2002, we've had more than 500 of our students just go doing engineering degrees, also do entrepreneurship programs. Like I said, that became university-wide. We then created a thing called Invent Penn State, right? So when the campus took it, um, the, oh, there we go. It's working again, apparently. Um, we, this Invent Penn State was launched in 2015, and this is really in the aim of spurring economic development um, growing out of the universities. The, the idea of the university being the driver for economic development across the, the state. Um, so there's job creation, student career, and, and really encouraging faculty and students to become entrepreneurs as well. Um, we also have a leadership development program that uh, about five years ago, MIT decided they wanted to have one and they surveyed uh, the US and, and concluded that Penn State had the strongest leadership program in the country, which I think they were right. Um, we've had just last year over 150 students have, have been involved in that. Um, and then most recently we started these things called launch boxes, right? Um, so the idea is to launch companies directly out of, of the university. Um, so that just started in 2016 and the idea is to take um, the people with the ideas for companies and connect them with entrepreneurs and with giving them the resources and support um, to make that transition from idea to product to successful company. And those have now been, the, the logo here says Happy, is Happy Valley. Happy Valley is the nickname for um, the area in Pennsylvania uh, where University Park is. But there's actually these launch boxes at many of the different campuses 
right? The idea being to put the resources right where you need them to make uh, spin-off companies happen. All right, so from there, let's go to superconductivity. Um, and so here's a brief outline of, of the, the path I'm gonna take you through, um, starting with the history, right, and ending up with, uh, with uh, invention. Um, so the discovery of superconductivity goes back to 1908. Um, this is Cameron Lingonis in his lab. Um, I told the story of um, John Bardeen insisting on, on Bob Schrieffer presenting the Nobel Prize work uh, for BCS theory earlier today. Uh, Cameron Lingonis was not quite the same person that, that John Bardeen was. Um, so uh, they were the first in the world to liquefy helium, um, and they were using that to their advantage to be the first to measure the resistivity of different metals um, as they cooled down. And there were different theories um, on what would happen. All the theories turned out to be wrong. So the story as I've heard it is Onus's grad student was making the measurements and he saw this rapid drop in, in resistivity. So he came and told Onus and showed him the data um, and Onus said, no, you must have done the experiment wrong. Go back, do it again. So the student felt bad, like he had done the experiment incorrectly. He started over, put the sample on the, on the system, cooled it down measured the resistance, and got the exact same result. This drop in, a, a slow drop in resistivity, and then a sudden drop to, to lower than they could measure. So we went and told Onus, no, I did it again, I got the same thing. Onus said, no, you're just not a very good student. Well, I'll go do it myself. So Onus went to the lab, did the experiment again. Of course, got the same result, published the work. Everyone knows of Onus and his, his discovery of superconductivity. Nobody knows the name of the student. Um, so there's, there's, there's people at all ends of the spectrum. Um, and uh, hopefully that behavior is in the past um, and not in the future. Uh, but Onus's group was really pushing um, this liquefaction. And the, the side bit of this story is um, Onus has discovered superconductivity not because he was necessarily the best physicist of the time, right? He discovered superconductivity because his group did the best engineering work of the time, right? His group discovered superconductivity because they were the first to liquefy helium, right? And that liquefaction of helium enabled them to do the measurement that proved everybody's theory wrong because nobody anticipated this. Um, and so it's, it's that relationship between engineering and science that, that enable each other um, that we forget sometimes. So Onus's quote, I think, is, is, is rather telling and interesting. He says, something unexpected occurred. The disappearance did not take place gradually but abruptly to less than the thousand millionth part. And mercury at 4.2, referring to Kelvin, has entered a new state which be, can be called the state of superconductivity. Right? So this is from his publication uh, in 1911 when he was talking about the discovery. You can see he's got a nice little Dutch smile. He's very happy. Um, <laughs> and then he, he went on uh, two years later. He immediately, now remember, Onus was the person who, whose scientific discovery was enabled by technology and he immediately saw Technology is the outcome of his science. So he saw the technical potential. Uh, he also saw the need for funding in his quote. Bearing on the problem of producing intense magnetic field, a great number of ampere windings can be located in a small space without heat being developed. So immediately he saw that superconductivity could lead to magnets, right? 100,000 Gauss, which is 10 Tesla, could then be obtained by a coil of say 30 centimeters in diameter and the cooling with helium re would require a plant which could be realized in Leiden with a relatively modest support, right? So even here again, right, technology and science integrated together, but the need for resources, right, to make it happen. Um, this was September of 2013. In December, when he was accepting the Nobel Prize, so just uh, three months later, um, he expressed that there were some difficulties with this goal of building magnets. He said, in a field above this threshold value, a relatively large magnetic resistance arises at once. Thus, an un I love this line, an unexpected difficulty faced us. The discovery of the strange property which causes this made up for the difficulties involved. So what happened is between September, when he was excited about the idea of making magnets, he took the material and he wound into magnets. And as he put current into the, the superconductor, right, it suddenly went from superconducting to very resistive. And he had no idea why. Right, so we had this unexpected difficulty. And this, is, this unexpected difficulty is why it took another 60 or so years before superconducting magnets even started to become um, small scale realities. So <clears throat> an unexpected difficulty, you know, what we don't know in science is often the, the obstacle. So what didn't he know? 
right? So what, what Onus knew, of course, at first was that he had what he thought was a perfect conductor, a conductor, a material that would carry, um, transport electrons with no loss. Um, it was much later that people discovered the thing called the Meissner effect, right? Which is the, the tendency of a, a superconductor to expel magnetic field, right? And then what he really didn't know, which was decades later, is that there's actually two types of superconductors, uh, type one and type two. So type one is what Onus had discovered, right? These are mostly pure metals and they are perfectly diamagnetic and they have very, they're also what I call perfectly useless. Um, they have very, at very low magnetic fields, um, they transition from superconducting to normal and resistivity becomes very high. And that's what he experienced in 1913 um, that, that caused him such frustration. So much later, type two um, superconductors were discovered. And these are mostly alloys and compounds. And they're identified by what we call in, in physics a mixed state. So the Meissner state is the complete, is perfect diamagnetism, right? It's the complete expulsion of magnetic field. And then in a normal material, you have full penetration typically of magnetic field, say if you have a copper wire throughout the material. The mixed state is a hybrid of that, and it's, it's shown here um, in this graphic. And the idea is that each of these little cylinders is actually one quantum of magnetic flux. And so a type two superconductor um, is like, if, imagine if you had a, a dam holding back water, that would be type one. If that dam had a little bit of leak all throughout the, the wall that let a little bit of water through, just enough to relieve the pressure so that the wall doesn't collapse, right? That's a type two superconductor. So each, this magnetic field on the outside, shown by the red line or arrow, um, penetrates into the superconducting block, but only in, in, in small amounts. So each one of these is one quantum of magnetic flux, right? And these then gives you what we call an array of magnetic vortices in the superconductor. And thermodynamically, that allows an energy balance between superconducting electrons traveling through the material, right? And these cores of normal material. So if you could just investigate what's happening within one of these vortices, the material would look normal, right? But it only takes up a certain fraction of the area, and then the supercurrent can travel around those vortices to let you have supercurrent. And that's a type two superconductor, um, which is what all the technology and superconductivity is based on. But if you think about this, right, you have an applied current this way, and you have magnetic field this way, right? Remember earlier today I say always trust the, the fundamentals, right? So the fundamentals say that if you have a current perpendicular to a magnetic field, you get a force, right? And that force is shown by these black arrows, right? And this force is, it's a Lorentz force and it's real. And in pure and clean materials, materials with, with minimal defects, these vortices will actually move. And I mean, one can actually see physical motion of vortices and they'll come to the edge and they'll disappear and a new one will be created at the other edge um, and they'll just flow and that's called flux flow, magnetic flux flow. So if you then think about Going back to Maxwell's equations, if you're sitting here um, as an isolated observer, right, and you see a magnetic vortice pass by you, right, you see, a, a, you see the magnetic field from the vortice, and as it comes closer, it gets larger and larger, and then it goes past you, it peaks, and it gets lower and lower. So from your vantage point, you're seeing a time-changing magnetic field, right? But a time-varying magnetic field is always correlated with an electric field, right? Del cross C is minus dB dt. So when you have, um, so remember, so we have a magnetic field, we create vortices, we apply a current, the vortices move, we see a voltage. So when in physics, when we say we apply a current and we get a voltage, right, that ratio is a resistivity. So in fact, even in type two super, and it's a, it's a real res resistivity, you could put a voltmeter on, on a superconducting material and, and, and have this happen and you'll get a real voltage. So again, we have a superconductor, but we're creating a voltage. So what happens is, is that one needs to actually, what we call pin these vortices. And so when one looks at the, the bulk of literature in applied superconducting materials, most of the effort is focused on engineering defects to pin vortices to stop them from moving. And it becomes an energy balance, right? So if you put, imagine putting a defect right here in front of this vortice, and by defect, we'd be a, a material that's not superconducting. So it could be a grain boundary, right? It could be a nanotube. It could be anything other than the superconductor. 
it's going to be energetically favorable for that vortice to stay on that defect rather than moving on. And that's how you pin vortices. And that's actually how you get um, transport current in a superconductor without loss. So it has to be type 2. It has to be extremely well engineered. And that engineering of defects in the microstructure has been the fundamental challenge to the translation of superconducting materials to magnets for the last 50 years. Right? Now, the, what is the optimal defect? So it turns out um, that these vortices have a characteristic size, which we call the coherence length. And the higher the critical temperature, the smaller the coherence length. And as the coherence length goes down, we also get a much higher upper critical field, so the maximum magnetic field where you're superconducting. And that's easy to remember if you think of a smaller vortice means there's more room for more vortices within the material, which is then higher field. Right? So as the size of the vortice goes down, the size of the defect to pin it has to go down. And so low temperature superconductors, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, the typical size of a, of a pinning defect is the size of a grain boundary. Right? In a high temperature superconductor, the optimum size of a defect is on the order of 5 to 10 nanometers, which is one of the fundamental reasons why high TC is taking even longer than low TC, is because it's fundamentally the need to engineer a kilometer length of material with nanometer scale defects that are uniformly distributed. Right? But in the end, it's really a question of, of defect engineering to get transport. Right. So what is the history then of TC? Right, so back here is Onus discovering mercury. Um, and so from 1910 to 1980, right, we see that it went from 4.2K to around 28 Kelvin. Right? And this BCS theory, the bardeen cooper schupfer theory, actually predicted a maximum TC of 35 Kelvin. The interesting unintended consequence of the BCS Nobel Prize is that people really stopped looking for, high temperature, for superconductivity at higher temperatures. Right? If the Nobel Prize winning theory tells you the maximum temperature is 35 Kelvin, you don't look for anything higher. And so that actually dissuaded and, and discouraged enthusiasm. Now if I take this graph and I plot it here and I add the discouragement of high TC, you can see how dramatic the change was. Right? So the first high temperature superconductor was discovered in 86 um, with this big jump in TC and then YBCO, right? and then the last real breakthrough or discovery was the mercury-based materials. Um, but the important thing for magnets is that it's not just TC, but this high upper critical field and ultimately a high current density. Right? So if we look at the history of upper critical field overlaid with the, the history of events in North America, right, we see that we went from discovery before World War I, um, before the Mexican Revolution, right, and then we started getting useful materials somewhere around the 68 Olympics and, and during the, the Vietnam War and, and civil rights movement in the US, right? And then finally, here we are um, with high TC being discovered only in that, that very small period at the end. Right. So another interesting thing that, that I think is worth thinking about in superconductivity is there's been at least 10 Nobel Prizes somehow related to uh, superconductivity. So starting with Onus, right, for his investigations of properties of matter at low temperature which led to the production of helium and the discovery of superconductivity. There was then almost a 50 year break, right, before Landau. And then here's BCS. Um, they did the work in 57, got the Nobel in 72. 73, 73, Josephson, right, of course, Osherhoff in 96. Um, and then Abrakosov, Ginsburg, and Leggett in 03. And the one that people forget about, um, in 2003, Lauterbar and Martin um, they didn't get their, dis their Nobel Prize uh, in medicine for superconductivity itself. They got it for magnetic resonance imaging, right, which is enabled by superconductivity. So technology enabled the discovery of the first one, and 90 years later, that science enables new technology, right, which actually wins a Nobel Prize as well. So from all of these Nobel Prizes, though, only one you could argue is what I would call translational into technology, and that's that last one. So, you know, the message here is that science gives the Nobel Prizes, right, but there's much more to it if you want to go from, from the scientific breakthrough to the technological breakthrough and then ultimately to the marketplace. All right, so critical temperature gives you Nobel Prizes. Critical current density um, going through a wire bridges physics 
to the applications via material science. And so this rather busy plot um, is basically the accumulation of the best current density versus magnetic field for all of the superconducting wires that are trying to compete in the marketplace. Right, so here, um, this curvy one here is niobium titanium. So this is at 4.2 Kelvin, and you can see it's very high current density at low field, like one Tesla, um, and it really starts to drop off quickly after about seven or eight Tesla. So this shows you, this, this graph right here shows why, one reason why, niobium titanium is um, the commercial material for this low field regime where you have MRIs and, and other applications I'll show in a minute. This next curve is niobium tin has a few curves depending on how you make it, but this is probably the best case, right? So niobium tin is, um, was actually discovered a year before niobium titanium in the 60s, um, but for metallurgical reasons, it's slower to develop and remains more expensive and brittle, right? But it has this regime of you know, it, it has high current density where niobium titanium doesn't because it has higher critical field, right? But then it also starts to drop off rapidly and after about 15 to 20 Tesla, right, it really goes down quickly, right? And then these flat curves are high TC, right? So this is bismuth 2212 discovered by Maeda in Japan, right? And this curve and this curve are the same material. These are both YBCO, yttrium barium copper oxide, this curve is for magnetic field oriented in the plane of the conductor, and this curve is for magnetic field oriented perpendicular to the conductor, right? But because del dot B equals zero, at some point, the magnetic field will almost always be perpendicular, right? Unless you get clever with engineering, and I'll show that in a bit. So you're limited by your lowest JC, so one of the challenges in YBCO is how to get this current density, right, and not be limited by this one. Right, but you can see at these lower fields, um, there's really no advantage for high DC. Niobium titanium is actually the highest current density at lowest field. Right? So what does it then take to convert a conductor to a magnet? Um, how, do we, how do we bridge that gap? So if you, suppose you could make a piece of wire this long that had very high current density at high field and you wanted to build a large magnet, right? You need to do what? You need to scale it up. So you need to be able to go from centimeters, which is where most material science scale length is done, to kilometers, right? So it's a, it's a translation from, from material science to manufacturing um, that's key. But with that, you have to have homogeneous properties. And the piece we often forget, right? If you're gonna do manufacturing scale up and produce large volumes of something, you better have someone who wants to buy it, right? And otherwise, you're just, otherwise you have very unhappy investors. Um, and until there's a demand, right, the cost is usually very high, right? And so this, this challenge, this balance between demand and, and supply, you know, which we talk about in economics as being price setting, the balance between demand and supply is really one of the fundamental drivers of whether something advances technologically, right? Cryogenics remains a challenge. It's where HTS hopes to solve the problem. Um, we talk a lot about the electromagnetic behavior, but there's wide varieties in terms of how well superconductors respond to strain and stress. So niobium titanium is, is ductile, it handles stress and strain very well, so you can take it, you can bend it, you can wind it, and you're ready to go. Niobium tin doesn't handle strain at, very well at all, so if you build a magnet, you have to wind the magnet and then heat treat it afterwards. So if you're making a large magnet, right, you need large furnaces and, and your manufacturing costs go up, as well as the, the challenges of quality control. High DC, you have both. Bismuth 2212 is like niobium tin. It's brittle, and the heat treatment is even more complex. YBCO, all the manufacturing challenges are basically come from trying to grow a one micron or two micron thin, perfect layer of oxide on a substrate continuously over kilometers. But once you do that, it's actually mechanically very robust. Um, stability and quench protection I'll come back to. These are magnet application issues. Um, but the cost of the, over, of the magnet overall in the application is an issue as well. Market acceptance I, I alluded to with scale up. Um, and the piece that we often don't talk about, which I think has probably been more important for superconducting uh, materials translating to technology than almost any other factor, right? Except perhaps cost. And that's the difference between being an enabling technology and a replacement technology, 
right? So by enabling, I mean without this technology, it doesn't happen, right? And with the technology, it does, as opposed to replacement, where you're taking something that's already in existence and just trying to be better. It's always much more challenging to be replacement. And I think in superconductivity, that lesson has taken a long time to learn. So what was the first big application? So there was just a, a the IEEE just had a big event uh, in Chicago, or outside Chicago at Fermilab, celebrating the Tevatron and, and commemorating it as an historical event uh, in electrical and electronic engineering history. So the Tevatron is a collider, right? So it's high energy physics. Um, and the idea, of course, is in, in colliders is to have a big ring of dipoles, uh, dipole magnets in a giant circle, um, and then to put fundamental particles in them and have them collide at a collision point and then see what comes out. So it's one of the fundamental ways that people in high energy physics study um, you know, what comprises electrons and, and um, fundamental particles. So originally the, the collider outside of Chicago at Fermilab was um, resistive and they wanted to double the energy of the system, right, to double the energy of the particles that collide. <clears throat> in this case, the, the particles are actually protons. And so they wanted to double from 500 gigavolts to one teravolt, terelectron volt. This is the energy of the proton itself. So tevatron refers to being one, ter one TeV, right? So when I say a big ring, how big do I mean? I'll show you a, the, a later one in a minute, right? But we're talking about 774 dipoles, magnets. Each magnet is seven meters long, right? So imagine the size of a circle, right, with 774 magnets, each of which is seven meters long, right? And with a seven centimeter aperture, so that's the size of the hole in the middle where the protons are gonna go. Um, and with that, they also need 240 quadrupoles, right, which are more complicated, which are a meter long. Um, all of these were niobium titanium. And so in order to make this happen, to make this succeed, right, you had to produce enough niobium titanium wire to produce 774 seven meter long um, dipoles and 240 1.35 meter long quadrupoles. You needed a material right, that you could produce in volume, that you could produce affordably, and that you could produce reliably because if any one of these dipoles performs different, significantly differently than the others, the entire experiment is a failure, right? So this system, this is what you call an enabling technology, right? Without niobium titanium, this could never have occurred, right? So because there was an enabling technology, so no, there was no competition, and because there was a, a desire to do this, right? Huge, amount of money, huge amounts of money were put into really understanding niobium titanium production and manufacturing to the point where this was a success that operated for almost 25 years, for 24 years of science, right? So this was actually the first big event in applied superconductivity, even though most of the, the, the fanfare was the science that came out of it, right? So what did this lead to, right? What, what's, the, what's the bigger picture result of the Tevatron, right? The number one impact of the Tevatron on society, if someone says, why would you spend all this money on high energy physics? What did anybody get out of it? Well, you got this. You got medical MRI, right? The only reason we have a medical MRI industry is because after the Tevatron was built, industry could make vast quantities of niobium titanium quickly, reliably, and inexpensively, right? And companies like GE saw that and said, oh, what are we gonna do with it? Um, so I don't know, how many of you have ever been inside of an MRI? You're lucky. I've been in it for at least four times. <laughs> um, but this is, an image of a, this is the image of a knee, not my knee. My knee wouldn't look that good. Um, <laughs> right? But this is now a thriving industry. So how, how thriving is it? Right? The projections are five to seven billion dollars market per year right, by 2021 for MRI. All of this because the Tevatron enabled niobium titanium, right? So this is the assembly plant in Oxford, and I need to change this because they've been bought, I think. So I don't know if they still go by that name. Um, but they've made millions of magnets, right? And niobium titanium is now a, a, what we would just call a commodity, right? You want to order copper wire, it's a commodity. You just order it and they ship it the next day. You want niobium titanium superconducting wire, you call up a manufacturer, you, you see what their products are, you buy it and they ship it the next day, right? In fact, the biggest threat to niobium titanium 
from a, from a market perspective, is actually the availability of niobium uh, in, in the earth and, and finding and mining it, um, which is interesting because you don't usually think what's the challenge to superconductivity. You wouldn't think it would just be uh, natural resources. So, we're, so we've, where is medical MRI going? Where else is it taking us? The next big thing coming out of this, right? So again, this all goes back to niobium titanium becoming a commodity, is what's called functional MRI as a medical research tool. Right? So this is actually real-time imaging of a human brain, right? and the areas that are lit up are areas where an MRI, a functional MRI showed brain activity, right? in this case when um, verbs were generated on a screen that the subject was watching. And so when an object appeared, the subject was asked to think of action words related to that object, and the idea was to see you know, how does different thought processes trigger different activities in the brain. Right? And so if you're doing science on trying to understand the human brain, then this is, a, you can imagine, it's a powerful tool. And this is probably about five or six years old now. Um, but these same types of applications are happening in vascular, cardio, in all different parts of the body, trying to understand uh, the human enterprise. Right? Here's some, just some beautiful images of the human spine right, and blowing up. Um, in this case, the, the breakthrough on top of the MRI was actually getting into surface coils that could get very close to the person. Um, so this image is done with only a three Tesla magnet, right? So now beam titanium enables this kind of picture of, of a human brain, right? Now, who else would use this? So suppose you're studying um, mental health, right? So in this case, they had someone who was suffering from schizophrenia inside this functional MRI. And when this person had auditory hallucinations, they could see which parts of the brain um, were activated by the schizophrenic event. So if you understand, you know, if you can start to understand where in the brain you're getting schizophrenic activity, then maybe you can start to understand why there's schizophrenic activity, right, and understand where the problem, where the source of, before you can solve a problem, you have to understand where it is. MRI is starting to unleash that. And then I actually saw this result last week. <laughs> and so this, and it's really fascinating, I hope you'll find. This is real-time 3D MRI imaging of a human brain. But now, rather than looking at, you know, this scale looked pretty cool, right? Now this scale looks kind of boring, because we can actually see activities in different fibers within the brain. So the idea here was they got a, an accurate picture of how brain regions talk to each other by imaging in three dimensions in real time, um, the connections between different parts of the brain, right? The challenge of studying the brain, of course, is that it's an interconnected activity. So we can see in the earlier images where the primary activity was, but those interactions are, are complex, right? So this just came, literally came out, I saw this result last week. And so this is uh, you know, GE advancing um, the imaging of, of, of human thought. Right. So going back to high energy physics, I know those pictures are cool, but going back to high energy physics, Right, after the Tevatron, um, because of the success, there was a lot of discussion of what machine will be next. So the US was going to build uh, a thing called the SSC, the Superconducting Super Collider, um, not far from, I don't know how far it is from here, where, where Waxahachie, Texas is, um, but that's where the site was going to be. And then in the mid-90s, the, and at the same time, Europe was going forward with um, the LHC, the Large, Large Hadron Collider, LHC, in CERN. Um, the LHC is so big that I can't tell you which country it's in because it's actually in two countries, right? So it's actually both in Switzerland and France, right? So you can see the, the, the Swiss-France border is here, right? This red ring, this red circle, that's actually the, the map of where the tunnel is that contains the entire collider, right? So now we've increased the magnetic field on those dipoles to 8.3 Tesla. Right? The radius of each dipole is about three kilometers of the dipole ring, right? so this is six kilometers across. Each dipole is now 15 meters long, so it's much bigger than the Tevatron dipoles, and there's 1,232 of them. Right? The length of this tunnel is 27 kilometers. Right? So the total amount of superconducting cable to make these dipoles is actually 1,500 tons, Right? It's 7,000 kilometers of superconducting wire. 
The magnets, when fully charged, store 15 gigajoules of energy, right? And that's coming from a, a converter at 60 amps, 24 kiloamps. Um, and interestingly, people think of the LHC as being a big success for niobium, tin, or sorry, niobium titanium, which is true. It actually has 1,800 high temperature superconducting current leads, right? So all that's doing is, is you're using superconductor to bring the current from the power supply bus bars into the magnet, just to save, um, you know, basically 11 kilowatts at 1.9 Kelvin, saving huge amounts of power, right? So from March 2010 to February 2013, they were getting 3.5 TEVs per beam. So that's three and a half times what they did at Fermi. Then they got it up to four TEVs, so four times greater. Then they did more upgrades, 2013 to 15, up to six and a half TEV, right, just about two years ago in 2015. And if you follow, Physics, oh, before me show that. So this is a, a schematic of one of the dipoles, right? Now keep in mind the precision, you know, you're trying to make two things the size of a proton hit each other, right? That's pretty good aim. <laughs> so to do that, right, this beam, these, these 1,232 magnets have to all have nearly identical performance and have perfect alignment inside the tunnel. So the number of magnets built to create this was even greater. And if you, just the, the entire operation for quality control and testing, right, and, and, and confirming each coil was correct um, was huge because these magnets are built over a period of a number of years, right, because there's so much of them, right? So this shows the inside of the magnet, right? This, this little part here, that's the superconductor <laughs> in the dipoles, right? This yellow light is supposed to be the proton beams. I don't think protons are really that big. Um, but if it was just one protein, you wouldn't see it, right? And then all of this that goes around it is to ensure the magnet operates properly, um, you know, in, in every way. So there's current bus, there's cooling, right? Remember, these are at less than 4.2 Kelvin. Um, but this whole structure, right, is driven by that little bit of superconductor on the inside. So it's really a remarkable level of precision engineering. And what did it do? It, it, just, it confirmed the existence of the Higgs boson right, on July 4th, 2012. Um, and if you talk to high-energy physics people, they talk about this frame called luminosity, um, which is really the measure of the ability for an accelerator to generate collisions in time, right? So it's a collision, essentially a collision rate. So higher luminosity means more data, right? And then a greater chance of seeing new physics. So now they're looking, of course, to upgrade to what they call the um, high luminosity LHC. So um, and if you, you know, there's, a, there's an important thing in life which is to always think big. And I don't think anyone's better at it than high energy physics, right? Because even as they've built this, right? And they're getting just the initial, before they even got the first data from this, they were talking about what comes next and what comes after that, right? So they're already projecting out what do they need in 2025? What do they need in 2030? What do they need in 2035? So the next big step for them is this high luminosity upgrade, right? Which is an upgrade of several components, including changing the magnets. So now they want to make the magnets shorter, but with higher field, which means going from niobium titanium to niobium tin, right? So they want to go from 8.3 Tesla to 14.2, uh, to 11 Tesla, right? And 4.2 meters down to 11. So why does going from 8.3 Tesla to 11 Tesla mean going from the commodity of niobium titanium to the challenge of niobium tin. Well, let me swing back, past all the good brain pictures, to this, right? This was JC versus field. So here's niobium titanium reaching eight Tesla. Current density is right around here, right? So to, if you want to do 11 Tesla, you're above HC2 for niobium titanium. Niobium titanium can't carry any current at 11 Tesla. So you have to go to niobium tin, which then puts you back here in terms of current density, right? So that need to go from here to here, just from this point, eight Tesla to 11, means a complete transformation in the required technology, right? So in this discussion of what's replacement and what's enabling, niobium tin has actually becomes an enabling technology for high energy physics when high energy physics wants to go up to 11 Tesla, which is their next step. So this will be either the first or second very large niobium tin project, right? And the, the hope, of course, in the, the 
magnet community is that this finally turns niobium tin into a commodity the way the Tevatron did for niobium titanium. Right? But this may not be the first one to do it. Timing matters. Right? There's another emerging low temperature superconducting application, again in Europe. <clears throat> Why do these things keep happening in Europe? Because the Europeans work together, <laughs> right? And they collaborate. And so it's the, the likelihood of one European pulling out of CERN is almost zero because all the others are going to go ahead without them, right? ITER, in fact, is not just Europe. ITER is the US and Russia and Japan and China and Europe. So it's a, it's a huge group of, of countries. And you know, the, the irony of ITER, it's thir actually 35 nations in total. Um, the idea of ITER, let me say the idea first, is a magnetically confined fusion reactor to demonstrate large scale, I would say pre-industrial power generation. Um, it requires 100,000 kilometers of an obium titanium and obium tin strand to operate at four Kelvin, 51 gigajoules of stored magnetic energy. This was first essentially agreed to in principle by two famous men, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev, when I was a graduate student. It then took decades to one, get all the other countries engaged and to negotiate the international agreements to allow it go forward. It may be, I don't know for sure, but it may be the longest, most complicated international negotiation in history. And we've gone through multiple cycles of nuclear disarmament agreements more quickly, right, than we were able to negotiate this agreement. One of the things that, there are two things that made it take a long time. One was the site, choosing where to build it. Ultimately, that came down to a battle between France and Japan. And France was chosen because they had previously built a superconducting um, tokamak uh, fusion device, and because n France has the best history of nuclear infrastructure and operating safe you know, nuclear plants safely in the world. The other thing that took forever was the decision of which country would provide which technology. So what they decided not to do was have every country com contribute money and then let one group manage the project with a budget and order what they need and build it. So instead, they parsed out the entire system and decided which countries would be responsible for delivering which parts. Everybody wanted part of the superconducting magnets. Right? People were far less interested in some of the things that were much more unique to fusion reactors because everyone saw that the magnets would be the thing that would then become a translational technology for other applications in their country. So they negotiated for decades, and they actually <coughs> divvied up the superconducting parts amongst almost every country. So this now is the current site. This is probably about a year old picture. This is in, in southern France. It, in some ways, it's like uh, Penn State. It's surrounded by cows. Um, there's not much else around it. Uh, this is the, the pit into which the reactor will be. So the reactor will actually be well below ground. Um, that's for both security and for safety, right? So if something goes wrong, the ground around it would absorb any um, nuclear problems from, from neutron generation, but also for security. It's much easier to protect it when it's down there. These are all the power buildings and manufacturing. Um, the power requirements are huge, so that the power supply um, transformers and all that take up a large footprint. Um, but then there's also lots of space for, for manufacturing, for assembly, uh, and then of course for operations eventually. So, if you look at what the schematic of the system looks like, it's this. Give you a scale, that's a person, not a midget. <laughs> it's huge, right? These are, and to break that down just to the superconducting part, this is what the magnets look like. So there are, um, these D-shaped coils are called toroidal field coils, and they're arrayed all the way around. This is a half cut, right? It's a full donut, or a full bagel, um, and then, this blue, the red, are coils that um, are used to start the plasma up and heat it. So there is, it's a solenoid, right? So the current goes this way in the red coils. It goes this way in the D-shaped coils. And then all of these other things are also superconducting magnets, right, that are there to control and shape this plasma, this high temperature plasma that I didn't want to study, right? Clearly the magnets are more interesting. So there's 18 of these big toroidal field coils. These will be DC coils at high field. All of these red ones are actually AC coils, so they get ramped 
Um, some of them have to go up and down to balance out the plasma. One, some's just ramp one time. Right? This is what one of those toroidal field coils look like today. This is a real coil. So this is one of the 18 of these. Right, so you can see those connections at the bottom. Right, are these connections coming out of here? So all of this, though, is still low temperature superconductors. Right? There's still no talk of high TC in this. So where are the promised high TC applications? Well, for starters, nubium tie and nubium tin were discovered just before I was born. Right? High TC was discovered when I was in graduate school. So there's a bit of a head start. Um, nubium titanium is an easy material for applications. It's a simple metallurgy. It's a binary alloy. It's ductile, easy to manufacture, inexpensive. Nubium tin is still seeking that widespread use because it's a more complicated intermetallic and it's more expensive and it's brittle. HTS materials aren't two, al two chemical elements, right? They're three or four plus oxygen, right? So they're much more complex because of their ceramics. Um, but because they have the higher TC and upper critical field, and thus in field, um, critical current density to high field, they remain attractive, right? But they have to find where they're enablers rather than replacements, right? And there are differences in operational behavior I'll talk about as well. So where is, you know, HTS, I say, is more likely to succeed as an enabling technology. So where is that happening? So high field magnets for science, um, first and foremost, and I'll show a bit of something that's happening right now. Um, compact high power motors and generators in, in this regard, they're, they're both enabling and replacement, right? So from the point of view of a superconducting motor, they're essentially enabling because you, get, you can get rid of liquid uh, helium. But obviously there's millions of motors in the world being made every day out of copper um, and generators have been operating for 60, 70 years also. And so they're really replacement relative to non-superconducting technology. Wind, wind turbines is one place where they have potential as well as um, ship and aircraft propulsion. You know, why are these applications different for HTS as a replacement versus enabling? The difference is that wind turbines, low weight is critical, and ships and aircraft, both low weight and low volume is critical. And that's where, I'll show in a minute, there's a huge difference between HTS and copper. And then a compact tokamak, the idea of taking this result and making it much, much smaller, um, has potential with HTS, right? But high field also brings high energy density and much larger Lorentz forces. And so the conductor is the starting point. So let's just touch on those for a minute. Um, one HTS conductor is what we call BISCO, bismuth strontium calcium copper oxide. Um, this was the one discovered at 5 p.m. Christmas Eve in Japan. Um, this is a cross section of a wire before heat treatment. These are two different wires from two different companies. This is a cross section after heat treatment, and you can see the crystal structure here. It's a nice, it's a layered structure. Because of this layered structure, um, a single crystal of BISCO is very anisotropic, right? So the, you get really high current density in this direction in the plane, and almost none in this direction. When you form it into a wire, you end up actually with sort of an average of the two orientations, um, which gives you a net isotropic behavior. Um, but it has some real challenges. One, you're taking an oxide uh, material and then you're um, trying to densify it, you're drawing it out. You have to use, you basically have three choices for metals to go around the filaments, gold, silver, and platinum, um, because you have to have oxygen permeability and you have to have something that doesn't oxidize, right? So essentially you're, you're drawing um, very hard ceramic within the silver tube. The silver is an intrinsic long-term cost, um, but it's also very soft. And so trying to densify the filaments is really one of the major challenges um, that's kept BISCO from, from exceeding. So in reality, this material is probably only going to be beneficial for very low temperature, very high field, narrow applications. And because it only has that one application, it doesn't have nearly the investment in, in advancing it. Now the other one is um, usually called YBCO, but it's actually been shown that a number of different rare earth elements can go here, so it's also called REBCO sometimes. Um, in addition to having this planar structure, it has chains along the copper, uh, in this direction, copper oxygen chains. 
Um, this is only made with high current density by taking thin film deposition techniques and scaling it up. And that's the fundamental challenge for, for Rebco is it, taking a, an intrinsically slow but high quality process and trying to do it continuously, homogeneously over long, long lengths. And so, you know, every year the maximum length of high JC goes up. So now it's in the range of a few hundred meters and it's trying to get longer. This material requires biaxial texture in plane. So this is a typical architecture, right? So the, the blue is a substrate. That's typically um, another view of the substrate is here, this nickel alloy. So this section in the middle um, is basically this, this, this layer. So you've got a you know, 50 micron or so nickel alloy substrate and then a number of different oxides, which are all, if you can see, anywhere from seven nanometers to 10 to up to 80 nanometers thick. And then finally, at the very top here, one, a roughly one um, micron or two micron layer of, of superconductor, right? So you've got 50 micron substrate and only one micron of superconductor, right? In order to make this work because it has to be biaxially textured. All of these intermediate layers are to ensure that the YBCO layer has biaxial texture. That's usually then coated with a layer of silver to protect the superconductor and then packaged in, in something else, typically copper, for reasons I'll get to. So here, the properties are fantastic, but it's intrinsically anisotropic, right? So there's high current density in this direction when the field's in plane, but when the field is normal, right, you get that Lorentz force. You get the current density here, the field here, and the flux can move, right, normal to both. Right. So you have challenges with anisotropy and you have real challenges with manufacturing cost and scale up. Right. Nonetheless, there's progress. And this is a, a real two scale photo um, of a motor that was tested in 2009, 36 and a half megawatts um, by American superconductor delivered to the US Navy um, for ship propulsion. This was tested 100% successful. This picture next to it is the, the equivalent power um, non-superconducting motor technology the Navy uses, right? So if you imagine you have a ship, you have finite volume, right? And the less space you use for your motor, the more space you have for food, water, people, or to make a smaller and faster ship. So the Navy's motivation is this reduction in size, and, and it was achieved. We've gone from 180 to 250 tons of weight, right, to less than 75 tons of weight. So they're compact and they're efficient. But since 2009, there's been basically no next step, right? Because capturing an historic market is challenging. Convincing the Navy to put people's lives at stake on something new when they have something that works is, is really the challenge. It's not a technological challenge at this point, right? It's a psychological and market acceptance challenge, right? So the question then is where is HTS enabling? How do, how do you overcome this challenge of acceptance. Well, one way is to show capability in other systems. GE wouldn't invest in MRIs if they hadn't seen the success of the Tevatron, not just because of the availability of the wire, right, but because they've seen that it can work and, and work over long periods of time. Right? So HTS is enabling in high fields. So this is my old laboratory, National High Magnetic Field Laboratory in FSU, and Manuel's old laboratory as well. Um, this is their current project. It's a 32 Tesla solenoid magnet, which is a combination of low temperature superconductor and high temperature superconductors working together. So they have a 15 Tesla outer LTS magnet with a 250 millimeter bore. Inside that 250 millimeter bore, they're gonna put the high TC magnet, right? This LTS magnet is actually both niobium titanium and niobium tin because at the lowest fields, you want to use niobium titanium. It has the highest current density, and it's cheap. Once you get to a field that niobium titanium can't do it, you switch to niobium tin. When you get to the point where niobium tin can't do it, then you stop, and you have to switch to the HTS. Right? So this is, and to give you a sense of current, it's 268 amps to generate 15 Tesla. Right? And that's seven megajoules of stored energy. So it's really small compared to ITER, but it's still pretty big. The HTS magnet that goes inside of it is actually built from two coils, right? Totaling about 10 kilometers of wire, right? And generating a total of 17 Tesla. So a 32 Tesla magnet, more than half the field is actually from high TC, right? So this gets then assembled, 
together. And where is this now? So they tested up to, they're in, in the process of moving up. They've achieved 22 and a half Tesla and they're expecting 27.7 this week and then they'll go to higher field from there. Okay. The one next big hope is again in Europe. And this is actually what's called the EcoSwing wind generator. It's a European Union funded project to finally get um, high TC significantly present in the wind market. Um, why is this important? Was well, a 40% reduction in weight with the same torque on the system, right? So they're gonna retrofit a 3.6 megawatt wind turbine um, that's out in the North Sea in Europe. This is really the first major commercial commitment to install HTS in the wind industry. And why is this important? There's a new st study which is called Drawdown, um, which is an assessment of I think over 100 different ways to reduce CO2 in the atmosphere, right? And it, it covers everything from um, building materials to refrigerants, right, to energy sources. Um, and it's been done basically with quantitative models and apolitically. And two of the top ways to draw down CO2 are offshore wind and onshore wind. And so making wind energy succeed um, is really essential. And this is where HTS is, is coming into play. So this is scheduled to, to implement in 2020, um, and hopefully that'll be successful. Okay. So why are we slow to market, right? It's this cost issue. Um, and then large scale applications require a larger conductor. And the other challenge for HTS is a fundamental one. It's called quench detection. This basically means um, if you have a magnet operating and there's some sort of fault condition, does the magnet get destroyed or do you safely shut it down so you can ramp it back up and operate again? That's really, it's, and it's the primary technological challenge for, for high energy density HTS magnets. So when we say stability, that means the magnet's ability to keep superconducting if there's a disturbance. Quench is what happens if it goes unstable. Quench detection means knowing this is coming and quench protection means knowing this is coming and doing something about it, right? For LTS, this has been solved for decades. For HTS, um, let me skip ahead. Um, for HTS, there's a difference in the way the normal zone grows. So in low TC, you get this disturbance, it propagates along the, the conductor, it develops a voltage, you detect the voltage, and then you can shut the magnet down. In high TC, the normal zone doesn't propagate. It just sits there and gets hotter and hotter locally, right? Now, that you would think that might be okay, right? It's not growing. The problem is if you measure voltage over end to end, right, you're measuring actually the integral of the electric field and the shape of the electric field and the temperature matter. So if you imagine measuring voltage over, say, an arbitrary one meter length, you get the same voltage whether you have a long, flat electric field or a very narrow and peaked electric field. But the temperature is what's important for destroying the magnet. So that narrow peaked electric field is a narrow peak temperature that would destroy the conductor and that's what happens in high TC. So ultimately it's a race between detecting and protecting the magnet. So one thing we've been working on in my group most recently, other than this thing, there we go, all right. Sorry, my computer's trying to do something funny. There we go. Right. So we say in English that, that necessity is the mother of invention. Right? And this is where small business in the US is really becoming innovative and taking the lead at solving these remaining three, but mainly the two big problems for HTS. One is the quench detection I just talked about, and the other is this need for large, high current cables. Um, so I'm going to talk about both of these in the few minutes remaining, and I'll skip through. These are the logos from the two companies. Um, so for the quench detection, we've been working on integrating optical fibers directly into magnets, right? So there are many ways to interrogate an optical fiber, right? The most common is a fiber brag grading to make a huge investment and build an entire optical fiber communication network. Once they did that, AT&T followed, and that became the standard. Now, you know, the reason that's not a very good story for HTS is that MCI is no longer around. Um, but I don't think it was because of optical fibers. So, so HTS is really looking for that, what is that breakthrough application that's gonna give it the application pull. Um, but entrepreneurial innovation is really the one of the master keys for those types of technological transformations. 
That was the case with, with optical fibers 40 years ago that led to MCI. That was the case for niobium titanium, and it's clearly the case today for HTS. Thank you. Which uh, you were showing the copper uh, engine for what a motor, the motor yeah. and against a hexagon shaped uh, motor. Uh, so my question is about the geometry. Uh, what well, that one? Yeah. Yeah. So why going from a cube to a hexagon shape? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's the question. Like, uh, so I don't know why the copper motor is a cube. Okay. To be honest with you, I, I don't know whether it's because they have other hardware inside or. Um, it's easier for shipping. I don't know. Um, for the HTS, it's essentially, right, they're trying to minimize weight. Okay. And so they fit the casing as close around as they could. Okay, so probably a better shape would be a circle, maybe? Well, you don't want it rolling on your ship. So oh, you, okay. you definitely want it flat on the bottom. Oh. And, uh, you know, for, for manufacturing, it's easier to weld and, and open, right? So these are weld lines here and bolts to keep it closed. So you want to be able to open and close it and get inside. Um, okay. so. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is related to the highest uh, critical temperature for superconductors. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, uh, the holy grail of condensed matter physics is to reach the room temperature uh, superconductors. So I will be thankful if you could comment something about it. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, I've heard very esteemed colleagues talk about it. Um, and it's really been now, what, over 20 years, 25 years almost, since the last significant increase. And not because people haven't been trying. Um, the question I always ask, which I've never gotten a good answer from, you know, the, the top experimental physicists, which I'm not. Um, is if you had a room temperature superconductor, would you know it, right? Because how do you know you have a superconductor? Either you have zero resistance, right, or you have dimagnetism. But we also know that if you have flux motion, right, you get voltage, so you don't know you have zero resistance. You don't know whether zero, non-zero resistance is flux motion or, or electron collision, right? And you don't know if the lack of dimagnetism is because it's not superconducting or because of flux motion. The thing I didn't talk about is flux motion is also thermally activated, right? So if you had a room temperature superconductor, the process of measuring its properties, electrical or magnetic, may actually hide the fact that it's superconducting. So if you're an optimist, you say, we have it, we just can't find it, right? Because we can't measure it. Um, if you're a pessimist, you say, if you have it, you'll still never see it. Um, and and, measurements and, and uh, measurement science is something we don't talk about, but the, what Onus called zero resistivity, today we would call high resistivity, right? All he knew is that the resistance went below what he could measure. And so, you know, it may be that, and this is speculation, it may be that the discovery of room temperature superconductivity is waiting for more and more sensitive measurement instruments, not new physics. And that, but that's just my guess. Tenemos otra pregunta por acá. So I think the biggest source of niobium is Brazil. Um, but I heard, but recently there was a discovery of a new, of some reserve in Nebraska, which surprised me. Um, the other place where there's actually huge um, rare earth reserves, which, which will explain a significant part of the last 15 years of of um, world military history is actually under Afghanistan. Wow. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the uh, you know, purely guess, but there's probably as much interest in Afghanistan because of that as any of the reasons that are given. Wow. I mean, so it's not simply China. It's not simply, yeah, exactly, exactly. 
Now, helium, in China actually has everything except helium, right? And so where does HTS become enabling for MRI is if you could do three tests, if you have affordable three Tesla MRIs operating at 40, 50 Kelvin without helium, then rural China becomes marketable. Oh, good. Yeah, I just want to... Okay, if in a nearby future you'll be able to see uh, novium titanium in daily use products just like uh, cell phones or computers. Um, in cell phones, almost certainly not because they have to be so cold. There, there's still effort trying to do superconducting computers, but that will more likely be um, high TC than, um, than the novium based. And for reasons other than TC that, that are um, buried in the, in the physics of electronic devices. Um, but I think YBCO actually makes a better Josephson junction than Nobium titanium. Thank you. And, and that's, that's what I think is actually one of the best examples of where it's a huge challenge to be a replacement technology, right? Because semiconductors keep getting better. So if superconductors try to do what semiconductors can do today, by the time they do it, semiconductors have gotten be even better. Okay. Okay. Uh, first of all, three things. Uh, first one, I love your presentation. It's an uh, interesting um, uh, topic. And the second one, it's I know that we are not in the top of the investigations and technologies, but uh, in the future that uh, the using of these electromagnetic things mm -hmm. are going to be a kind of contamination for the planet because we are living in a planet that used the uh, electronal negativity and things like that, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Uh, do you think that these things could be uh, part of the contamination in the future? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, so again, if you look at the optimist versus the pessimist, um, before, I, so maybe this is because I'm older than you, but I do have young kids. I worry more right now about CO2 than electromagnetism as a, as a um, threat to the planet. Now, it's very, so when I talked about that drawdown and how um, you know, wind turbines were you know, a key part of the solution, you know, the question I have for that is, what are the problems created by the solutions? Right, and, and I think, and in a sense, that's what you're asking. But you know, it's almost like if you've got a disease, you take the medicine to kill the disease, then you worry about the side effects, right? Um, so I hope not, and uh, you know, but and I hope we find out. <laughs> okay. Well, we thank so much uh, the our plenary speaker today thank you. again. Thank you. And now as as we're. Custom to give a <coughs> plate. Uh, Professor Nieto is going to thank the speaker again. Oh. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And, uh, uh, bueno, le estoy entregando una placa uh, que le estamos uh, dando como reconocimiento por su magnífica presentación. Me va a permitir leerla. Dice la Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez a través del Instituto de Ingeniería y Tecnología otorga el presente reconocimiento al profesor Justin Schwartz por su destacada presentación Superconductividad, que hemos aprendido del laboratorio a la industria, por una vida científica, por una ciencia vital, bien la fecha y las firmas del señor rector y del maestro eh, Francisco López, director del instituto. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you. <risa> Les agradecemos mucho que hayan participado en esta conferencia. A mis estudiantes de CEU, los quiero mucho. Los are my, my undergrad students from Fields and Waves class. They're, 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 the, they were my undergrad students for the fall semester, Fields and Waves. And <risa> Does he do a good job? Yeah. Okay, good. <risa> trying to, trying to. <risa> y bueno, esta es su casa. 
Eh, la universidad se debe a ustedes, ustedes son el, el principal motor del trabajo de investigación que todos como profesores, Profesor Justin Schwartz, viniendo de allá con una agenda tan importante que tiene con ese nuevo puesto, este, como pudieron ver la universidad ya es muy grande y tiene que ver con muchas áreas y lo hacemos con en el, en el afán de que ustedes tengan la mejor calidad edu educativa. ¿Okay? Muchas gracias por asistir una vez más.